from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It's my great honor this morning to be able to introduce Rita Dove to you. She has had so many honors and awards conferred upon her. I am just going to select a few to mention. Rita Dove served as Poet Laureate of the United States and consultant to the Library of Congress from 1993 to 1995. She also served as Poet Laureate of the Commonwealth of Virginia from 2004 to 2006. Rita Dove was awarded in 1987 the Pulitzer Prize in Poetry. In 2001, she was awarded the Duke Ellington Lifetime Achievement Award, and in 1996, the National Humanities Medal. In 2008, Rita Dove received the Library of Virginia's Lifetime Achievement Award, and in 2009, she received the Fulbright Lifetime Achievement Medal. In addition to her poetry, Rita Dove has published collections of short stories and essays, a novel called Through the Ivory Gate, a play called The Darker Face of the Earth, which was produced here at the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC, among other venues. She's also written a song cycle for soprano and orchestra called Seven for Luck, which was premiered by the Boston Symphony Orchestra at Tanglewood in 1998. From 2000 to 2002, she wrote a weekly column for Book World called The Poet's Choice, and I know I'm not the only one who misses that column. I really enjoyed that column. Given all the distinctions and honors Rita Dove has had conferred upon her, I am embarrassed to tell you that the Library of Congress made a typo mistake when it printed the title of her newest collection of poetry, which is called Sonata Mulatica. It's spelled in your programs with two L's, M-U-L-L-A-T-I-C-A. -L -L That's wrong. It should be M-U-L-A-T-T-I-C-A. What can I tell you? Even Homer nods once in a while, right? So typos happen. It's it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to introduce Rita Dove. Please welcome her with me. Thank you. Great to be here. And yes, typos happen. You just have to deal with them. You know, I would really like to get to your questions as soon as possible because I, I always find that um, I might have a certain agenda and then something else comes out of left field from you. But let, so, but let me do it this way. What I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about um, how I became a writer and how that led to this latest book, Sonata Melodica. And, um, read to you a few poems from the book so that um, you can get a sense of it. Uh, I, I'd say right off, I'm going to make a confession and tell you that my first writing, the, the reading actually, that I, that I really fell in love with was science fiction. And um, I still love science fiction, uh, but my brother, who is two years older than I, would get a subscription to Analog uh, Fantasy Magazine, and whenever he finished a copy, he would let me read it. And so I began to, what I loved about science fiction, and this is when I was nine, 10 years old, was the fact that worlds were totally imagined, and yet the people who were in these worlds were like you and me that they were human beings moving through a world that they did not understand and trying to figure it out using everything that they had in their past, all of their emotional baggage to make uh, you know, quantum theory, leaping and all that kind of stuff work. So for a 10 year old that made sense. You give, you know, as a child you're always being plunged into, if you remember, you were plunged into situations where you 
are constantly trying to figure out the language. And so science fiction felt very close to me. There were also aliens in science fiction. And aliens did not look like your white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. And they had three eyes, they had green skin, all that stuff. And that appealed to me as well because they were different. They were looked at differently by the quote unquote human beings. And very often they would prove to be smarter than the human beings. Uh, you know, they had civilizations way beyond ours. And that appealed to me as well because I always felt, as a 10 year old, I felt like I was different. Not completely alien, but I was made aware of the fact that I was different. I was listening to uh, Esmeralda Santiago talked this morning at the Washington Post breakfast and she talked about the fact that she um, had to invent the lives that were not in those books. The ones, you know, that she never saw her own face in the books that she read. And I began to read at, uh, other things, but then I realized that I, I was not in them. There was no black girl in the story, and so I began to write short stories first to put myself in them, and then poems. Why poems? I think it was poems because I was also, at the same time, terribly in love with music. I began playing the cello when I was 10, and the timbre of the way music moved appealed to me. This was a language that I that I understood. And poetry is the closest thing to music, I think, in language. And I think that's why poetry has always been my first love, though I've written other things. So that's a little bit about my background. I come from a family of chemists. It isn't uh, necessarily in the genes. My father's a chemist, my brother is a computer scientist, my sister was a chemist. So, so uh, I'm the I'm also an alien within my family because, you know, they are all into science. Um, one of the greatest moments of freedom for me was when I came to my father. Um, I was a junior in college, and he, um, I decided I wanted to be a poet. So I told my mother I wanted to be a poet. She said, tell your father yourself. And <laughs> I went into the room, and I said, Dad, he was reading the paper. I said, Dad, uh, I, I, I'm going to be a poet. And he stopped for a second, swallowed, and then he said, I never understood poetry, so don't be upset if I don't read it. And all I could think of was, yes, <laughs> he's not going to read it. Um, I continued to play cello all the way through college and into my young adulthood, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I needed music in my life. I loved classical music. I loved playing in small ensembles, string quartets or trios, because it was the closest thing to a, a, a symbiotic relationship that I could think of. You really had to listen to each other. When I was in high school, I had a group of friends. We all decided we were going to, we were all classical musicians. Um, a whole group of black friends, and we decided we were going to play jazz. That didn't seem like much of a stretch. And, it, and, and what was interesting, what it, it was like close ensemble work. And so we had a group, and, and we played jazz for a while. I kept up with my music, even as I began to write poetry. And I had one of, one of my creative writing teachers in college said one day, as a warning, don't ever try to describe music, to write about music. It won't work. So of course, that's all I've ever done, I think, my entire life, is to always be drawn back to trying to describe music. All of this as background to this book, which is called Sonata Melodica, as Maureen said. It started with a very unusual and, I think you could say, kind of inconsequential moment. I was watching a movie with my husband at home. We had rented a movie. It was called Immortal Beloved. It's about Beethoven. 
And there's one scene in the movie where Beethoven, who is just going deaf and is trying to decide if he's going to tell the rest of the world or try to fake it, uh, he walks through a group of musicians who are waiting to play for him. They're very eager. You see their faces. And among these musicians is a young black man, all dressed up in 19th century finery. And I'm thinking, no, this, what's wrong with this picture? I mean, where did he come from? Thank goodness for Google. I simply put in black violinist Beethoven and it came up. At that time, there was only about one entry. He did exist. This was a man, his name was George Augustus Paul Green Bridge Tower. He not only played violin during the time of Beethoven, but Beethoven had stopped work on his third symphony in order to compose a sonata for this young man. He dedicated the sonata to him. They hung out for a few weeks in Vienna. And then, just as suddenly as this all happened, uh, Bridge Tower disappears. He disappears from history, so to speak. Beethoven destroys the dedication and rededicates it to a violinist named Kreutzer, who never played it. He said it was impossible to play, it was too hard. Bridge Tower had already premiered it with Beethoven at the piano. And I thought, where did he go? Where did he go, this incredible prodigy? Why did he disappear from history? That began this book. It had everything that I loved uh, in my life that, I, that, you know, besides poetry. It had music, classical music. It had, you know, German, which is something that I've always been, you know, I've always studied German and I love German. And it also had some other very little thing, and that is that quality of being a stranger among people who still accept you. Because I, I wanted to find out what it was like for Bridge Tower to move through 19th century Europe. And that began my quest. The biggest difficulty with the book, and I'm going to first, I'm going to start with a, an early poem. The biggest difficulty was to get past Beethoven. Beethoven, the marble bust on the piano, the one that you labor under. And so, interestingly enough, when I, I began gathering information and material, it was hard to find, and uh, it went off in all different directions. But one of the first poems I wrote was in Beethoven's voice, because I had to get him out of the way, basically. I had to kind of stand up to him. And it was the, the first poem that I wrote. It's in the middle of the book. Um, and you're, I'll get to it in a minute, but let me start earlier. Because when I began to imagine what it was like for this man, this, this bridge tower, what I found out about him was that he started playing violin when he was probably about five. He went on the concert tour when he was nine. His father built himself as the African prince. So you know he was a character, but he took his son on the road, and there was this young boy uh, in the middle of Europe playing in front of royalty, and I thought to myself, he must have been terrified, even if he was a prodigy, he must have been terrified. And so, um, here's a poem, takes place. 1789, he's nine years old. His father has taken him to Paris to make money. You have to imagine that if you are a musician, at that time without I, you know, iPods and without MP3s, you have to play live. You know, there's no recording. And he's at a concert in Paris. 1789 in Paris, not a good time to be there, right? But he was there. What doesn't happen? The notion that the carriage wheels clattering through Paris remind him of the drums from the islands in his father's tale. Click, clack, sputter, whir. He could make a song of it, dance his foreign hand down the cobbles of the Rue de Bac as he balances his small weight against the pricking cushions. Clack, sputter, whir. All the cadences jumble together 
except the thudding dirge of his heart. That he can see in curtain twilight the violin case in his lap twitch with every jounce like an animal trapped under the hunter's eye. That he can sense down shrouded alleys danger rustling just as surely as he can feel spring's careless fingers feathering his chest and smell April's ferment in the stink of the poor marching toward him. Though none of this is true, he hears nothing but clatter. He can't see the rain-slick arc of the bridge passing under him as the pale stone of the palace rears up and he climbs down to be whisked into the massive salle de machine, his father's cloak folded back like a bat's tucked wing because it was a dry spring that year on the continent. Nonetheless, he ignores his heart's thudding and steps out onto the flickering stage, deep and treacherous as a lake still frozen at sunset, aglow with reflected light. Soon the music will take him across. He'll feel each string's ecstasy thrum in his head and only then dare to open his eyes to gaze past the footlights at the rows of powdered curls. Let's see the toy bear jump his hoop, nodding, lorgnettes poised, not hearing, but judging. Except for that tall man on the aisle with hair the orange of fading leaves and two girls beside him, one a younger composition of snow and embers, but the other Oh, the other, dark, dark yet warm as the violin's nut-brown sheen. Miraculous creature who fastens her solemn gaze on the boy as if to say, you are what I am, what I yearn to be. So that he plays only for her and not her keepers. And when he is finally free to stare back, applause rippling over the ramparts. Even then, she does not smile. Now, thank you. Thank you. There's a little story behind that story. Because the facts I had were that he had played in Paris in 1789 that spring. And I thought to myself, what would it be like for a little mixed race boy, because his mother was Polish, his father was African, to be standing in front of all of these dignitaries who came to the thing? What would it be like? And then I thought, wouldn't it have been wonderful if Thomas Jefferson had been at one of those concerts? Because he was in Paris at that time. And I fretted over the fact that I couldn't find this out until my husband said, oh, just call it what doesn't happen and you can do whatever you want. <laughs> so I did. And I began, and I wrote, uh, started working on the poem and I was still doing research and I live in Charlottesville, which is Monticello land. So uh, I, I was up there a lot. And one of the um, researchers came to me one day and said, I have this book that might be interesting to you. And it turned out it was a, a recording, a, a, a listing of, all of the concerts that Thomas Jefferson had gone to. He was a, just an incredible note taker. And he had noted down all the concerts he had gone to and who played. And he had indeed been at one of Bridge Tower's concerts. Which gave me a, I, I don't think Sally Hemings was probably there, but that's my little piece of information. So, so there we have this boy. Um, my impulse was not I wanted to recover his life, but as I, the more I went into it, the more I realized I wanted to, to, to bring him to life, which means imagining a life, because we don't know. You know. We don't know anything but the facts. He went to London, here's another fact, he went to London um, right after Paris, because Paris was getting a little too hot at those times, you know, so they skipped over the, over the channel and went to London, and he gains the Prince of Wales' attention, and so he begins to play concerts at the theaters there. And 
music was everywhere because people didn't have it plugged into their ears. You heard it on the streets. And there were street musicians as well. In my uh, research, I stumbled across another incredible figure. His name was Black Billy Waters. And that's what he called himself. He had a peg leg, he played the fiddle, and um, his pitch where he played was right outside of the Adelphi Theater. And when I looked at all of these old maps, I'm really a nerd. I mean, I, I had old maps of London, I'm looking through things. I realized that this little boy and his father, the African prince, would walk past Black Billy Waters on their way to the concert. And the father would dress his son up in, out, in kind of, I wouldn't say African clothes, but let's say they were clothes that the Londoners imagined Africans would wear, <laughs> which means pantaloons and all sorts of things. So, so he was dressed like that and they would walk past Black Billy Waters. This is Black Billy Waters' poem. Black Billy Waters at his pitch. All men are beggars, white or black. Some worship gold, some peddle brass. My only house is on my back. I play my fiddle, I stay on track. Give my peg leg, thank you sire, a jolly thwack. All men are beggars, white or black. And the plink of coin in my gunny sack is the bittersweet music in a life of lack. My only house is on my back. Was a soldier once led a failed attack in that greener country for the Union Jack. All men are beggars, white or black. Crippled as a crab, sugary as sassafras. I'm Black Billy Waters, and you can kiss my sweet ass. <laughs> my only house is on my back. There he struts like a Turkish crackerjack. London cues for any novelty, and that's a fact. All men are beggars, white or black. And to this bright brown upstart, hack among kings, one piece of advice, don't unpack. All the home you'll own is on your back. I'll dance for the price of a mean cognac, sing gay songs like a natural born maniac. All men are beggars, white or black. So let's scrape the cat gut clean, stack the cords three deep. See, I'm no quack, though my only house is on my back. All men are beggars, white or black. Thank you. Thank you. I, I call that my Donnell Gone Wild. Um, it's a little longer than Donnell, but, but as I was working on that poem, I thought, what, what kind of form, what kind of form would be best for Black Billy Waters? And I thought, what he did every day was to play the same songs over and over. He's on a loop, right? So Villanelle with those repeated lines was the right form for him. The father was a character. There are many characters. And what I discovered about this whole period was that I had come to it imagining bringing my 20th century sensibility at the time to it where it was a totally different sensibility. And race relations were complicated, but very, very different, extremely different. They did not have the economical baggage that we have, which made it slightly different. Um, the father was a great hit at court, too big of a hit, in fact. And after he seduced a few too many ladies, the prince, basically banished him, basically paid him off and said, I'll take the boy and raise him. You must leave the country. And so what happened is that this young boy who was dressed up in these outlandish clothes was taken in by the Prince of Wales, not too shabby, except that he's alone in the country that he's just learning the language to. And the first thing that the Prince of Wales says to him is, let's get you out of those clothes. The undressing. First the sash, peacock blue. Silk unfurling round and round until I'm the India ink dotting a cold British eye. Now I can bend to peel off my shoes, try to hook the tasseled tips into the emerald sails of my satin 
pantaloons. Farewell, sir, monkey jacket, monkey red. Adieu, shirt, tart and bright as the lemons the prince once let me touch. Goodbye, lakeside meadow. Goodbye, hummingbird throat. No more games. I am to become a proper British gentleman, cuffed and buckled with breeches and a fine cravat. But how? My tossed bed glows, while I, I am a smudge, a quenched wick, a twig shrouded in snow. He does grow up to become a proper British gentleman. But how does he get to Beethoven? How do we get to that moment that started this whole thing? It turns out that this young man, this young violinist, he really was, by all accounts, a remarkable violinist and was, um, and, and was pushing himself. He had heard that there was a composer in Europe who was pretty remarkable. And some people thought he was crazy and too avant-garde, and some people thought he was, was amazing. And so he decided he needed to go to Europe and find this Beethoven and see if he could play for him, with him, whatever. And so he took a leave of absence from the court, got, and he went to Europe and decided to seek him out. And now we're getting closer to the moment that started all this. He, he actually wangled away to meet Beethoven and stood in line with a bunch of other musicians to play for him. This is the moment for three seconds in the movie that we had watched that started the whole thing. What did Beethoven see in this young man? By all accounts, and there aren't many, they were great friends for about oh, a few months. Beethoven dropped everything he was doing to compose something for him. Now you have to consider that at this time, Beethoven is beginning to go deaf. He is a composer. This is the worst thing that can happen to you. When he meets this violinist, um, he is already beginning to feel alienated from his own world because he can't hear half the time. His hearing went in dribs and drabs and in screeches and howls. And they struck up a certain way, I think, of friendship and aliens. This friendship was the moment that I chose to enter the book. And the first poem that I wrote from the book, as I said, was Beethoven. And I'll read that now. This is Beethoven thinking about Bridge Tower. Vienna Spring. A lunatic angel has descended on Vienna. No sooner had I given up on the violin as no more than a tiny querulous beast suited solely for dilettante monarchs and their peg-legged street bakers, do I make the acquaintance of George Holgreen's bridge tower, mulatto musician, magician most monstrous. After such delicious execution of an afternoon's program so decidedly pedestrian, there's nothing to be done but repair to a neighboring Wirtschaft where, noch ein Maß, Mädel, I fear I must revise my former assessment. Though dipped in ink, this Jacob has grappled the shining messenger for a glimpse of heaven and won the battle. Entirely master of his instrument, he climbs the strings agile as the monkeys from his father's land. Ah, immortality has a new wrought human face. How I love my handsome, brash new friend, this twilight stranger who has given me myself again. So then, why not everything and at once? Four strings on a chord with the silence beyond, solo and chorus, the declaimed and the whispered. All that I know, and know I am losing, have been losing, have lost, lost. If you listen to the Kreutzer Sonata, this sonata, thank you. That's your homework. Go home and listen to the Kreutzer Sonata. 
because what you will hear at the beginning of that sonata is something that everyone thought was insane at that time. You'll hear not a violin playing to a piano accompaniment. You will hear a solo violin. Then you'll hear a solo piano. And it's a call and response. They talk to one another back and forth for quite a while before they come together. Beethoven composed this sonata. He finished it the night before. There were parts which he could not copy and he told Bridge Tower just at lib. <laughs> he did. It was so great that Beethoven who was playing the piano jumped up and said do it again. He did. The reports are that they watched each other and that Bridge Tower, who was a very flamboyant player, moved a lot. And I thought, there is a man going deaf at the piano watching his music as much as he is hearing it. You know, that's just, it's, it's such an amazing moment. And, and that gave me, I guess that gets kind of the in into how the relationship worked and how it fell apart. Now, I'm going to skip a little bit because I really want to get to your questions, but I will tell you that um, this friendship did not last very long. And that according to the report, Bridge Tower said he made a saucy remark to a girl because they were going out together, he and, and Beethoven, and that Beethoven took offense. And that's why he destroyed the dedication. In one instant, it disappeared. Try as I might, I could not find any information about that saucy remark, right? What was it? What could it have been? I had to make it up. I had to imagine that moment. And the more I worked through the book, the more I, I you know, worked with this life, I realized that I didn't want that saucy remark to be encapsulated in a poem, per se. Uh, I didn't want to give it that much importance because for Bridge Tower it wasn't important until later, afterwards. And so in the middle of this book there is a little spark, kind of Mad Magazine-like spark, uh, with Beethoven and Bridge Tower and that saucy remark. Why a farce? Because farces were very popular in Vienna then. And believe me, my farce is tame compared to some of those, and, and mine is exactly... Um, PG. So um, I would like to end with a poem near the end of the book and then invite your questions because it's a moment where fact, real life, meets imagination again. Bridge Tower lived to be 80 years old. He met Beethoven when he was in his 20s. He led a respectable, by all accounts, music musician's life. He just had missed that moment. Perhaps he had more than 15 minutes of fame, but you know, it disappeared. So he lived on. And near the end, I felt like I'd lived with him for so long, and, and um, I was really kind of crazy at the end. I was writing day and night. And, all that kind of stuff, that I wanted to find out where he had died, just to see the place where he had died. He went back to London. He did die impoverished, I found out. Uh, the, the witness for his death was an illiterate person who just signed it with an X, his next door neighbor. And so armed with those maps and a very patient husband and a semi-patient daughter, we went back to London just to see the spot. So I will end with uh, this poem, which is called The End with Map Quest, and then we'll do questions. The End with Map Quest. Will I cry for you, Paul Green? Will I drag out your end, though it is long past, though I drove slowly past the place of your dying days and recorded what I knew I'd find there, families and townhouses, a sensible Vauxhall parked askew in the carport behind the green grate. 
Well, I tell you, whispering to no one in particular how even the street sign seemed greasy and that it was raining, Natch. And whenever I tried to focus on the thought of you laid out in one of those miserable victory cottages, no turret, no gilded palms, no jiggling regents, I had to do something, crack a joke, or snap another useless photo of the Bellington Primary School. But when we turned left to round the block for the fifth time, it was the perfectly dismal sight of a fast food joint on the corner, Sam's Kebab, which cheered me. Would you understand the red and yellow neon scripts shouting like a Janissary band, so tacky it was buoyant, colorful because there was no good reason to be afraid of shouting with the whole world determined not to hear you, though they tried to shut you up all the time. Do I care enough, George Augustus Bridge Tower, to miss you? I don't even know if I really like you. I don't know if your playing was truly gorgeous or if it was just you, the sheer miracle of all that darkness swaying close enough to touch, palm tree and sambo and glistening tiger running circles into golden oil. Ah, Master B, little great man, tell me, how does a shadow shine? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you have any questions, thank you so much. If you have questions, please, I think there are microphones and we'll tackle as many as we can. Well, there. <laughs> I know that book came out after I had found out about that, which is really oh, great. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we all okay. kind of okay. got the same source, I okay. think. Yes. So, so uh, my real question is, um, last year at, at this event, uh, I was uh, once again book signed um, by this lady named, um, oh, the lady that really uh, got in trouble for sitting on the bus instead of the Rosa Parks, uh, Calder. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, you wrote a poem about it. Yes. Too, the night. The oh, Claudette Colon. Claudette Colon. Yes. Right. Okay. And um, and so I went to get my book signed by her, and I asked her how she liked this poem, and she said she'd never heard of you. Really? She'd never heard of this poem. Huh. And, and so my question was, my God, how did you write that poem? Because that's how I learned about it. Oh <laughs> my gosh. It's amazing how, how fact and, and life kind of yeah. they mix together. Um, the poem to which she refers is a poem called uh, uh, Claudette Colvin Goes to Work. And Claudette Colvin, of course, was uh, one of the young women who was arrested in Montgomery uh, during the, the segregation um, disturbances in the 50s uh, before Rosa Parks. And the NAACP was very careful to choose, they wanted to choose someone who would not be, was unassailable, let's put it that way. And they, so they chose Rosa Parks as the figurehead and not several people, uh, Claudette as well. And, and I've always been fascinated by, I, I guess taken by those who don't make it into the history book which is most of us, you know. It, it's, it's life, you know, that's what, and, and a, a corollary to that is, of course, even for people who happen to make it into the history books, it's also every day you walk along and none of that gets in the history books, and that, that's what makes us uh, love life so much. And that's what started me on that. I don't, you know, I, I just had to follow her, so. I'll go over here and then there. Yeah. Do you have um, a favorite science fiction novel that has 
woman of color as the protagonist? Wow, you've gotten very specific. Do I have a specific um, science fiction novel that has a woman of color as a protagonist? Ah. No, I mean, I would, uh, I would suggest, when I, was, when I was growing up, there were none, let's put it that way. They were different colors, but they weren't women, you know. <laughs> they weren't necessarily the colors, you know. Uh, but I, and now my mind has gone completely blank, but um, see me afterwards. I have a good suggestion. I just have to remember it, okay? Okay, thank you. I was terrifically fascinated by Tuvok in Star Trek. Uh, Tuvok, because he ran against type. He was, not, he, you know, looked like a black, he was a Vulcan, and he had no emotion. And I thought that was, I was fascinated by him. Hi, it's a pleasure meeting you. Um, I teach high school in England, and I have the pleasure this year, for the first time ever, being given a creative writing class, which excited me and terrified me at the same time. Because when you get to the poetry unit, I have such a tough time evaluating their work in a, in a constructive manner when it comes to poetry. If I have had an opportunity to work with young writers. You know, the, the difficulty is that it is impossible to evaluate poetry that way, in a way that you can, can, can justify to a school board, <coughs> put it that way. And, and, um, <coughs> and what happens is that then teachers are terrified of teaching poetry, so they don't or else they try to find a way to quantify it, which terrifies the students, because if you're moved by something, you're gonna be moved beyond the language to describe it or to evaluate it. I suggest to young writers that they, um, that they remember that the writing, the heart that they bring to the page is never damaged. If someone says that they don't understand the poem or they don't like it or, you know, that is, has nothing to do with the heart. It has to do with the language. It has to do with the tool that you're using. And to remember that, not to be discouraged, but just work on the language. Because what you're feeling, it just means you haven't gotten to it yet. And conversely, if you're talking about interpreting poems, to remember that there is a vocabulary, a language that can help you start to talk about what we all know is impossible to talk about. But that's the same with music. It's the same with art. It's the same with anything I in the arts. The thing about literature is that it, you use the same language that is being employed as the medium, and that's what screws us up. So, okay. Thank you. Yes. Yes. You were there before, I think. I'm a teacher also, and uh -huh. uh, first I just wanted to compliment you because when you talked about what you did with Big Water and how it inspired you and how you researched them and then they went to your art and everything you did. That's exactly what we're trying to teach children to believe about education, that it's all connected, that whatever you do helps you understand a little more about everything else. Where I struggle, and I sort of feel like her, is knowing of young students who do want to be poets. You came from what sound like a fairly affluent middle class background, and your parents were heavy set. What do we tell the kids are writing who do want to be poets, how do they do it? And, I, and I'm speaking now not just to the art of it, but how do you make a living? How do you stay with it? <laughs> make a living from it? <laughs> Support your habit, you mean? I'd like to stand out at least, at least make mom and dad not think the world has now ended. That you're at this college, you're poor, and you're going to try to be a poet. You give them, what you do is you give them the arsenal of, of example. So many writers came out of uh, lower middle class families or illiterate families and we don't even know that. You give them, the, so they can go to their parents and say, well, you know, so and so was a poet and you know, they, they came out of this kind of background. And, and that's what you give them because that's what the parents will begin to understand, that it's not something totally new under the sun. My father was the first person in his family 
uh, the only one of his siblings who went to college. And they, you know, and you know, there, there are stories, you know, they, they unraveled his socks and their socks to make him a sweater so he could go to school because he was the only one they thought had a chance. You know, that, that gives you, a, a, they have to hear these stories so that they can also tell their parents, no, you know, love me, support me. I believe in what I'm doing, okay? Mm -hmm. I believe, in my, I have, okay, I'm over time. And so if anyone, join me over at the signing tent, we'll answer your questions. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.